And this third panel and the closing panel um, is really focusing on what data, what research do we have about taxpayers and particular taxpayer segments, both um, regarding um, use of return preparers, use of online accounts, um, and this is, I, I shouldn't have said taxpayers because it's more about human beings. Um, and so this panel really does have um, no one directly related to tax, really. So it's bringing some different perspectives to the, um, this whole discussion of what the future state of the IRS might be or should be. So what we have this afternoon is we have Michael Best, who's the senior policy advocate for the Consumer Federation of America. We have Aaron Smith, who's the Associate Director of Research for Pew Research Center's Internet Project. And we have Arturo Gonzalez, who is the Chief Consumer and Community Development Research for the Board of Governors of the Federal Reserve System. And I have cited each of their work um, in my annual reports, and so I was thrilled that they were willing to come and share with us, you know, some of their perspectives. And because they're all about research, they all have slides, which is just, you know, like really neat um, after lunch. So without further ado, the, the way this will go is that each, each panelist will make a five minute or so presentation, and then I have some questions, and we can open it up for the floor. So, um, Michael, you want to go? So oh, I think we have to wait. You're going to turn on that microphone. Oh. <clears throat> I don't think you have to, but he. Oh, he has to. Sorry. Gotcha. Well, hi. As Nina said, I'm the senior policy. Is this on? Yeah. A senior policy advocate at the Consumer Federation of America, and I'm here to talk to you about why it's time to regulate aid repairs. CFA is a nonprofit association of approximately 280 pro consumer groups founded in 1968 to advance the consumer interest through advocacy and education. Uh, one of my main issues there is to work on um, establishing consumer protections in the uh, paid preparer industry, specifically around unenrolled, unregulated paid preparers. And I want to talk to you about three main things today, very briefly the instance of use of paid preparers, the problems that we know exist in the paid preparer industry. <laughs> and our recent uh, 2016 national poll uh, showing broad public support for consumer protections within the industry. So here's a, a tax year 2011 snapshot of the use of paid repairs. So 56% of returns were done by paid repairs in 2011. 59% of EITC returns were done by paid repairs in 2011. And of those, 74% uh, of those EIT returns were done by unenrolled paid repairs who weren't regulated in some way. As you can see, this is actually for 2014, but 55% of all the paid repairs in 2014 were unregulated. So we know it's a large segment of the market. We know it's, there's a high instance of use, particularly among low-income uh, consumers. And that's what makes this issue, I think, particularly important. I think for a lot of Americans, their tax return, um, you know, if they're getting a little bit of money back on what they paid or they're getting an earned income tax credit, is an extremely important financial event for them. And we need to make sure that they're going, the folks they're going to are, 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 are honest or educated or making sure they're getting every dollar they're entitled to. And don't end up, say, losing the EITC credit because, for instance, it was claimed and then it turns out that they weren't allowed to claim it and they could lose access to it for up to a decade. So we know high instance of use. We also know through a, lot, a long history now of mystery shopper tests, both by consumer groups on the left in the yellow and by government groups on the right in the red, that there is a high instance of problem with paid return, paid return repair. So these are the instances of uh, mistakes and probably some fraud, though it's always hard to tell that through mystery shopping tests. The percentage of returns tested that were incorrect. And so as you can see, it's really high. The most recent consumer one, 93%. The most recent government one, the GAO, 89%. So what do we need? We need a regulatory regime with three main components. Pricing transparency, a detailed explanation of services and prices before the return is prepared. One of the things that all these consumer mystery shopper tests have shown is the variability in pricing. So you know, one tax return that's identical to the second tax return can be hundreds of dollars apart when they're going to two different preparers. And oftentimes people are not told up front what this will cost. So that's, that's something we'd really like to see addressed. Education requirements and competency standards, so tax education, skills testing, continuing education. Uh, we'd also like to see regulation of credit products and ancillary fees. I mean, though refund anticipation loans are largely a thing of the past, I mean, you know, we, we definitely worry about seeing new tax time financial products that take advantage of lower income taxpayers. 
um, to fund uh, to fund their tax returns with. So we'd like to see the ability in any sort of consumer protection regime to regulate those as well. This isn't in my graphic, but I, sh I should also add um, that there should be a strong enforcement mechanism within whatever we do. Some of you may have uh, read recently that the Comptroller of Maryland recently stopped taking returns from 23 Liberty tax franchises and a handful of other independent tax franchises. And I think they probably would have liked to have been able to take more action than that. Maryland actually does regulate unenrolled paid preparers, um, but didn't have a sort of strong um, enforcement regime. But there is now a bill going through the, Mass uh, the, the Maryland legislature to give them those powers. So that's, that's, a, that's a fourth piece that we should always be thinking about when we're developing these. So currently, four states do regulate unenrolled preparers. Um, as I'm sure you know, the Loving decision in 2014 invalidated IRS regulations of unenrolled paid preparers. Um, I think ideally, we'd like to see a federal solution. But given the uncertain timeline in that, me and, and our coalition of groups that we work with in this issue are working at the state level uh, to pursue uh, consumer protections there. So to our 2016 poll, which we're really excited about. So we know high incidence of use, especially by low income tax, tax uh, payers. We know there are a lot of problems. But what we didn't know is, well, does the public think this is a problem? Does the public want to see consumer protections? And it turns out they really do. So we got really great numbers in this national poll. So of course, we first asked, you know, who's using uh, paid repairs? I mean, half of the public uses paid repairs from time to time, and nearly a third uses them frequently. 80% of the public supports requiring paid tax repairs to pass a competency test. Oh, I lost my values. Sorry. We even tested it. PowerPoint. Uh, but 80% do support. The yellow uh, is 59% strongly support. 83% of the public supports paid tax repair licensing. <laughs> 9 out of 10 of the respondents support an upfront list of fees before the work is done. That was a really good number for us. And again, this is something that comes up over and over in the mystery shopping testing, where just you, you're, you're often not told until your return's done, and you're probably not going to go somewhere else, what the return's going to cost you. And you know you can go to multiple places, and it'll be a different price. So people really want to see that. A majority of the public believes that paid uh, preparers should uh, have special training, but don't need a degree. Oh, sorry, I lost my number there, so let's look at the, look at the <laughs> keep a hard copy. 89%, oh wait, no, 86%, which is good. I mean, that's sort of the regime that we're talking about, right? Um, the second highest value, they need to have a college degree in accounting, which actually kind of surprised us, is uh, 31%. So we, we weren't expecting to see that. But the majority of people support sort of what we're talking about and these unenrolled preparers that they don't have to necessarily have a college degree, but they have to have some kind of special trading and tax separation. That's what people want to see. So where does this leave us? We have high incidence of use. We have high incidence of problems. We have public support of regulations that bring consumer protections. That equals, it's time to regulate. I mean, I feel like all the pieces are there. We've been working on this for a couple of years now. And um, you know, we're getting more and more information that I think supports this happening. Um, what it doesn't equal is increased unregulated repair access and involvement, I think, within the tax system. Uh, the National Taxpayer Advocates last report um, you know, talked about uh, the future state vision having online uh, tax accounts that unregulated preparers would have to have access to to make them to make this the sort of the system they're envisioning work. I, mean, I find that pretty troubling. I mean I really think that before we're expanding the role for unregulated preparers or unenrolled preparers, I mean we should be first making sure the role they have now even is working. We have to establish some kind of minimum standards uh, for these folks. So with that Please uh, feel free to email me with any questions. If you want to see our materials, they are uh, printed out there, our, our two reports, including the, um, including the slides. And you can always go to consumerfed.org. <laughs> yeah. All right, so. Uh, there we go. All right, we get it? OK. Uh, so as Nina said, I'm uh, Aaron Smith. I'm with, with a group called the Pew Research Center. Uh, we're a uh, subsidiary of the Pew Charitable Trust. Uh, and we do uh, 
public interest survey research on a number of social topics. My group studies the impact of the internet and other digital technologies. And I'm actually a former uh, client of the taxpayer advocate. And so I'm very happy uh, to be here since they were so nice to me when I uh, was having problems that nobody else in the IRS could fix. Uh, this was not a quid pro quo. <laughs> Uh, and so uh, when Nina asked me to do this, I was a, very happy to uh, help out. And so what I'm going to be talking about, uh, obviously, there's a big push towards uh, moving uh, client services online. And so I'm going to talk about some of the broad trends that we're seeing uh, in the population uh, as pertains to uh, how people uh, access the internet and online information. Um, nope. Oh, geez. All right. Let's see. Arrows? Ah. Did that. Hmm. So it's showing on my screen, but not. Oop, sorry. I'll let you. One moment, please. <laughs> Technology. This is an advertisement for the online accounts. <laughs> I asked computers. <laughs> Yeah, I feel like I feel like it's just me standing here watching yeah, my right, PowerPoint. Right. Yeah, right. It looks ah, great. Here we go. Okay. okay. Um, <laughs> great. Okay. So, there we go. Um, so, uh, at a broad level, uh, the first thing I think is worth noting that even is that even in uh, the year 2016, 15 uh, percent of Americans, uh, when we ask them if they use the internet from any device from any location, uh, tell us that they do not do that. Uh, so if you leave with nothing else, uh, the notion that everyone uh, out there is even online, uh, regardless of what type of, the, of device they're using, um, that should hopefully uh, disabuse you of that notion. And uh, when we look at uh, internet usage by different demographic groups, there's uh, some uh, variations by various uh, demographic factors. Uh, but age is by far uh, the most prominent. So if you look at uh, Americans under the age of 50, uh, well over 90% uh, say that they go online. Uh, if you look at Americans age 80 and older, uh, fewer, and half, uh, fewer than half of those older users uh, tell us, uh, or those older Americans tell us that they're internet users. And when you look at uh, the barriers to adoption uh, for people who are not currently online, what you find is that uh, most of them have a number of challenges uh, to accessing the online world. So uh, many of them uh, face uh, challenges around digital literacy or technology skills. So for instance, if you ask uh, people who don't currently use the internet whether they would be able to do that on their own, uh, the vast majority of them uh, tell you that they would not be able to do that without assistance. Uh, many of them have physical disabilities or chronic health conditions uh, that make it difficult to use a keyboard or a mouse, much less a uh, small smartphone screen without a physical keyboard. Um, and many of them, particularly for uh, much older users, you know, I, I think, I'm thinking about my 92-year-old grandmother who has made it through her nine decades in life without ever uh, going online or using a computer. You know, someone like her certainly doesn't see uh, the reason why she should spend her time, effort, money uh, learning how to use this seemingly complicated technology um, to uh, limited potential benefit. So uh, that's a very quick gloss on one part of the equation, which is people who are completely divorced from uh, all of these things that I think most of us in this room uh, take for granted. Uh, if you look kind of at the opposite end of that spectrum, uh, uh, you'll find that about 2 thirds of Americans say they have uh, broadband at home. And so uh, obviously, broadband at home is kind of the gold standard for online access. The, the FCC and various government entities have spent a lot of effort uh, promoting increased broadband adoption. Uh, and when you look at uh, the data that we've collected, what we found is that uh, broadband adoption has really uh, plateaued in many ways uh, in the last couple of years. So uh, broadband adoption today is about uh, what we found it to be uh, three or four years ago. And uh, there's a sort of interesting kind of trend going on here. So we've seen broadband adoption plateau. At the same time, when we ask people uh, about the importance they place on broadband, we see uh, significantly more uh, non-broadband adopters today um, saying that a lack of broadband adoption or a lack of broadband at home is a real disadvantage uh, for doing various things. So whether that's uh, getting access to government services, uh, getting health information, uh, accessing job information, uh, over the last five years, we've seen a big uptick uh, in the perceived importance of broadband uh, to non-broadband adopters. So. Broadband is seeming more important. Uh, at the same time, uh, adoption has actually plateaued. What's going on 
In many cases, the answer is cost. Uh, so when we ask people uh, who don't currently have broadband at home uh, why that is the case, uh, the number one reason uh, that they tell us uh, is that either the cost of the monthly service is too expensive or the cost of a computer is too expensive. So 43% uh, of broadband non-broadband adopters uh, say that cost is uh, the primary reason why they don't currently have broadband. Uh, Two thirds tell us that uh, cost plays some factor uh, in addition to others. So uh, the story there is uh, increased perceptions of the importance of broadband, flatlining in uh, actual adoption of broadband, in many cases uh, as a result of financial and economic strains. And so uh, what we're seeing is uh, many of those non-broadband non adopters uh, are now turning to their uh, smartphones and other mobile devices to bridge those gaps. So we've got, you know, you can sort of think of it as a spectrum. So you've got a group of people uh, who aren't online at all. You've got a group of people who have sort of gold standard access. Uh, and then there's a group of people in the middle who don't have gold standard, but also uh, say that they go online. And for many of those uh, Americans, uh, their smartphone is their uh, primary access point to online information. So uh, to put some numbers on this, 13% uh, uh, of American adults tell us that they don't don't have broadband at home, but that they do have a smartphone. Uh, that's a five point increase uh, from what we found a couple of years ago. Uh, and for certain uh, subsets of the population, that number is even higher. So if you look at, for instance, uh, low income Americans, if you look at communities of color, uh, as well as a few others, as many as, as one in five uh, members of those uh, communities uh, say that their smartphone is their uh, primary access point uh, to online information. Um, so in many cases, uh, those financial factors uh, that are preventing people from getting uh, sort of gold standard service, uh, they're using smartphones as a way uh, to get sort of next best service. You might want to think of it uh, that way. Um, and so uh, obviously that, you know, some access is, is better than no access. Uh, but we definitely see in our work uh, that uh, relying on one's smartphone uh, for internet access as opposed to a more traditional setup um, can, can really have some real challenges. So uh, I'm going to talk about some research that we did in the context of uh, job seeking. So uh, we looked at this in a couple of different ways. Uh, we first asked people, um, you know, would it be easy or not easy if you needed to do a variety of things? So everything from you know, look up job postings online to submit an application or build a resume. And across the board, uh, people without broadband um, were much more likely to say that it would be challenging or not easy for them to do that. So um, one impact of this is that uh, people's ability to engage with sort of complex activities or uh, kind of cognitively challenging uh, things that they need to do online uh, can be much more difficult uh, when they don't have access to uh, a broadband uh, a subscription at home, either because they're operating through a small smartphone screen or because they have to you know, reroute their lives in order to get to a library or a coffee shop or, uh, you know, I don't know if any of you read the New York Times article on um, school children without broadband. And, you know, they're literally sitting up against the wall of the school after hours um, trying to access the public Wi Fi from the school so that they can do their homework. Um, so that's one uh, impact of uh, lack of adoption uh, in, a, in a meaningful sense is that it's just much more challenging for people to do anything beyond sort of basic activities. Uh, the other impact is that we're seeing people uh, do very challenging activities on their smartphones. Uh, so uh, we've asked a, a set of questions about how people use their smartphones in job searches. And uh, that, that smartphone only group that I mentioned a moment ago, uh, a quarter of that group has used their smartphone to fill out a job application, uh, and more than one in 10 uh, have used their smartphone to create a resume or a cover letter. And I think we can all probably agree uh, that's maybe not the ideal way you'd like to be building your resume or cover letter uh, is on your smartphone. But for uh, people for whom this is the the uh, primary mode of access uh, to online information. Um, in many cases, they're having to uh, use that option that's available to them uh, as opposed to uh, maybe the best option uh, that we would like them to be using. Uh, so that's a really quick gloss on uh, a lot of data. And I'm very happy to uh, fill in any gaps in the Q&A. But hopefully that was helpful. All right. Thank you for having me here. I'm actually going to be reading um, my presentation. I usually am very much about numbers, graphs, tables. But I think uh, our, our report, which I'm going to reference, is such 
uh, has such wealth of information that it would be doing an injustice if I was to only show you three, four slides. So my motivation here is to give you um, an overview of what the board has been doing and get you so intrigued that you're going to rush home either to a mobile device or to your internet and take a look at our reports, <laughs> download their data, begin doing all the data analysis that, that we've done, uh, and you can do it for yourself. So first of all, thank you for the invitation to provide information about the Federal Reserve Board's ongoing research to better understand consumer access to and interaction with mobile financial services. First, um, I would like to say that the views expressed today are my own and do not necessarily represent the views of Board of Governors of the Federal Reserve System. Mobile phones have become increasingly uh, tools that consumers use for banking, payments, budgeting, and shopping. Given the rapid pace of evolution in the area of mobile finance, and the Federal Reserve began conducting annual surveys of consumers' use of mobile financial services in 2011. The series of online surveys focuses on consumers' use of technology to access financial services and make financial decisions. Topics include consumer access to bank services using mobile phones, that is what we call mobile banking, and consumer payments for goods and services using mobile phones, what we call mobile payments. <coughs> the surveys provides insights into trends in the adoption and use of mobile banking, payments, and shopping behavior and how mobile financial services affects consumers' interaction with financial institutions. The latest survey was fielded in November 2015, and the report summarizing its findings will be pu published in March 2016. Details of each survey, its methodology and limitations <coughs> are included in every report. All reports and data from all years of the survey are available on the board's website. Uh, for First, I'd like to clarify what we mean by mobile payments, mobile banking, because I think that's a very important grounding that we need for our discussion. The Federal Reserve Survey defines mobile banking as using a mobile phone to access your bank or credit union account. Similarly, mobile payments are purchases, bill payments, charitable donations, payments to another person, or any other payment made using a mobile phone. Both activities are accomplished by using a mobile phone to access a web page, by sending a text message, or by using a downloadable app. So next, I would, what I'd like to do is to briefly highlight the key findings from the fourth and latest report called the Consumers and Mobile Financial Services 2015. So as of December 2014, 39% of adults with mobile phones and bank accounts reported using mobile banking. And that's an increase from 33% a year earlier. The most common use of mobile banking is looking up account balance or recent transactions. Transferring money between accounts is the second most common mobile banking activity. More than half of mobile banking users received an alert from their financial institution through either text message, push notification, or an email, making this the third most common use of mobile banking. Remote deposit capture, or depositing a check to a bank account electronically using a mobile, ca mobile phone camera, was also a very common mobile activity. The 2014 survey showed that 51% of mobile banking users deposited a check, in a, a, check in, a check using their mobile phones. This was up from 38% the year before. Turning now to mobile payments, as of December 2014, 22% of mobile phone users had made a mobile payment. This is up from 17% the year before. For smartphone owners who reported using mobile payments, the most common types of mobile payments were one, paying bills through uh, an online system or the mobile app, two, making online or in-app purchase, and three, paying for a product or service at a store. Besides a mobile phone, people interact with a bank through various channels, such as visiting a branch, an ATM, a telephone, or online banking. Mobile banking, is the, first, is the fourth most common banking channel in 2014. This is up from fifth the previous year. So number one, uh, may not be surprising to everyone here, is banking at a branch, which is at 87%. Second was going to an ATM at 75%. Third is online banking at 74%. Fourth, as I mentioned, online bank, uh, mobile banking at 35%. This is up from 30% the previous year and telephone banking at 35, 33%. So as I mentioned, mobile banking has moved up from five to fourth from the previous survey. 
The main impediments to the adoption of mobile financial services from our survey continue to be one, a preference for other methods of banking and making payments, and two, concerns about security. Of those not using mobile banking, the primary reason given for not using mobile banking was a belief that their banking needs were already being met. This was 86%. The primary reason given for, um, by non-mobile payment users for not using uh, mobile, bank, mobile payments was that they believe it's easier to pay with cash or credit or debit cards. This was at 75%. Concern about security of the technology was a common reason given by non-users for not using mobile banking. This was 62% <coughs> and mobile payments at 59%. However, concern over security by non-users was down from 2013, where in that year, 69% uh, was concern given for mobile banking and 63% for mobile payment. Lastly, let me finish by saying that for the first time, the 2014 survey looked at differences in mobile banking and mobile payment use in rural areas versus urban areas. Residents of non-metro areas have lower incidence of using mobile banking at 33% and mobile payments at 17% than residents of metro areas, 39 and 23% respectively. The 2014 survey was conducted in December of 2014 and the report was published in March of 2015 the survey was conducted <clears throat> on behalf of the board by GFK, which is an online consumer research, research firm. More than 2,900 re respondents completed the survey. So I look forward to answering any questions and participating in the Q&A. Thank you. All right, so I think that these three panelists have sort of shown some information about, you know, online users, people who don't have access, and some of the implications for the IRS future state vision. And so I have a few questions, and I've, I've sort of asked everybody um, on the panels this particular question, one version of it or another. Um, and even if you're if your own research hasn't been quite on point about it, I'd actually like your personal opinion about this. Um, the F IRS's future state vision sort of describes um, moving taxpayers from per talking to IRS employees uh, directly to communicating with the IRS online, and it has you know posted some vignettes that you all have seen showing some of these interactions. Um, and in my personal opinion, I've thought you know this could work maybe for cookie cutter type issues, but not for more complex ones. Um, so I'm really wondering what your thoughts are regarding you know will online services supplement or actually replace telephone or face to face? What you're seeing in your own areas? What you're seeing in trends? Um, and then I'll sort of follow, ask some follow-up questions. I know you've all touched on it, but just I wanted to really ask that question directly. You know, do you think it'll supplement or do you think it will, you know, replace? Do you want to? Do you want to weigh in on that at all? Sure. I mean, that doesn't touch my work, I guess, directly. I mean, I, I guess my fear is that if if they're sort of angling, which I think your 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 sort of analysis of this. Uh, in your in your last report went to I mean if they're sort of angling to do cost saving to hoping to replace some of those you are going to need again this third party most of the third parties are unregulated um, we know there are a lot of problems with them we also know that like you said cookie cutter examples I mean if you just have a W two you can probably do your own stuff you can probably interact with them if it's a more complex tax return which I think includes things like the EITC you see a greater uptick on use of the, these paper pairs so I think you're going to see you're going to see more. You're going to end up having to see more interaction, um, and, and I definitely find that troubling without any kind of like follow-up regulation. Right. Um, so I actually went back to the vaults a little bit on this because uh, we've we've asked about this. This is about five-year-old data, so take it with the appropriate grains of salt. But we did a study uh, in 2010 looking at people's interactions in a general sense with government, and we asked them uh, sort of how they preferred to get in touch with government when they had an issue or a problem. Um, and at that point, 35% um, said that they would prefer to talk on the phone, 20% uh, would, would prefer to talk in person, and 28% uh, would prefer online. So more than half mentioned some sort of offline uh, approach. Um, what was interesting is when we asked them sort of how they had gotten in touch with government in the last year, and you would think that well, I guess one possibility is that people who had more online interactions with government would have correspondingly fewer offline interactions. And what we found was actually the opposite. So uh, the people who had the most uh, online interactions, whether that was online or email, um, also had the most phone calls and the most in-person visits. And so I think we sort of have to extrapolate a little bit, but I think what's going on there is that people are happy to 
you know, deal with, you know, do online chats or things like that to a certain level of complexity. Uh, but once things get very complicated, um, once things start impacting their money or their, you know, retirement, you know, uh, get a little more uh, sort of a high level, um, they want to be able to speak with an actual person and um, sort all that out. Well, as, as someone who tried to make an airline reservation this past Saturday online and then ended up spending two hours on the phone, right. after I made that attempt between Saturday and Sunday, I can, you know, understand that right. evolution of the transaction. It's, it's great until it breaks, right. and then, uh, <laughs> uh, then maybe it isn't quite so great anymore. So we, we certainly, again, this is a little bit uh, long in the tooth at this point, but certainly um, we saw online as a supplement to rather than replacement for um, traditional ways of uh, getting service. I think our survey speaks in this, to the same point, which is that um, consumers have various options about how they interact with their bank. You know, we visit a branch, go to an ATM, online banking, mobile phone, telephone. And what we find was that consumers like them all um, to a varying degree. So um, we found that about 82% of uh, reported using four or five of the channels. That's, again, it's over 80% use a combination of the channels. Uh, only 2% used one or two. Um, so very few people stick to one type or two types. Most use various uh, combinations. Um, you would think, well, what about mobile, bank mobile banking people? Those are kind of slightly uh, self-selected in terms of technology. Maybe that's how they choose to interact with financial institutions. Well, among them, uh, usage of other channels is still quite high. We asked them what kind of uh, channels they use. 95% said that they used online banking, not surprising. 92% um, used an ATM. 85% visited a branch and spoke with a teller. 36% um, uh, used a telephone. So all those other channels, aside, aside from the telephone, seem to be utilized by mobile bankers throughout you know, the previous 12 months of the survey. Uh, telephone less likely uh, to be used than the other ones. But uh, this, again, suggests, uh, as, already, as already been mentioned, that uh, channels are more than likely used and viewed as substitutes rather than as complements for each other. You know, to me, that data from the Federal Reserve is really important because the IRS has often said it needs to model itself after how people, what people expect of the financial industry, and you are surveying users, you know, of the financial industry per se, and you know what their use is. So that's very important. Um, so this is a question for Mr. Best. Um, so we've talked a little bit about the impact of um, the IRS. Uh, using preparers as intermediaries, you know, giving them access to um, the online accounts, both during the filing, the actual filing of the returns, if there are questions about, you know, what, what entry was put on the return, maybe the IRS has information that says, um, we think you've left off a, wait, a W-2 statement or something from your return, um, and then also post-filing. So, um, and that, that Preparers would be able to, on behalf of their clients, if they were given authorization, to do corrections on the returns. So my first question about that is, based on your experience, you know, surveying and researching the tax preparation industry, what do you think the impact on pricing would be if taxpayers are encouraged to interact, you know, um, with the IRS more extensively through their preparers, using preparers as intermediaries? Well, I mean, you know, I mean, our, our sort of, our sort of <laughs> It, it's always often hard to talk about pricing because, of course, nobody knows what the price is. So through all of these, through all the studies that have been done, you can never say, well, this is what the reasonable price is because there's no, there's no like reasonable mean of, of, of what it costs to do anything. So I mean, so so my, my first sort of instinct is to say, well, it's going to cause more confusion because it's already confused unless we do something about that. And then secondly, I mean, I just can't imagine a world in which it's cheaper for you to use an intermediary to pay them to do this for you, right? So it'll cost more, and because the pricing in the unregulated sphere is so problematic to begin with, it'll just exactly that problem. So you, you touched on this briefly, but maybe you'd elaborate. So what's the risk to you of, to, to, in your mind, of expanding online access to taxpayer account interactions to return preparers when so much of the population is unregulated and has no requirement to demonstrate you know, tax knowledge or competency? And, and more importantly, how could we minimize that risk? And if we can't get Congress to do it, what else could we do? Well, I mean, so I think, so, so number one, I mean, just sort of reiterate what I guess I already said. I mean, we shouldn't take sort of a, 
a broken piece of this, which is, I think, this unregulated sphere, and increase, and increase their, um, their participation in the system because we know it's broken. So we shouldn't do that until we fix them. Um, what else can we do if Congress <laughs> won't do it? I mean, I think, we can, I think there is still work to be done at the state levels for states to regulate. We're going to continue to work there to get more state consumer protections. I mean, I think we could also push there as to say, well, only enrolled and credentialed preparers um, you know, can access these accounts and restrict access. But I think as you touched upon in your own report, that's going to make this very difficult. If they're talking about really expanding the use of these online accounts and most preparers are unregulated, they're going to need unregulated preparers. Um, I mean, so it feels like a catch-22 to me, but then you don't want to bring in these unregulated preparers because we know that that's a broken piece of the system. Okay, so this is a question to Mr. Smith. So, you know, you talked in your testimony, you talked, you, you noted that about 30% of Americans, if I have this right, don't have broadband, and that broadband access has plateaued over the last few years. So, how do these, ta these taxpayers access the internet? How do they access the internet? Sure. So, well, uh, a lot of them do not. Uh, so, if you take that, you know, roughly third of the population that, that doesn't have broadband, a um, little less than half of those just tell us, I don't, I don't go online at all. Uh, if you look at that remaining uh, segment of the population, uh, it's, it's really kind of a grab bag. Uh, a lot of them have smartphones. Uh, a number of them are using, uh, say, public institutions like libraries. So for instance, 27% 27, 27 of Americans uh, have uh, used a computer or Wi-Fi at a public library in the last year. Um, I mentioned the, the New York Times article on um, children and, and the, what they call the home, homework gap. Um, you know, a lot of them are using you know just sort of wherever they can get either a Wi-Fi signal uh, or access to a computer, whether that's at you know a friend or family member's house, um, sitting at the you know McDonald's parking lot, uh, or in their public library, or using their smartphone. So there's not necessarily um, you know sort of a, a consistent. Uh, set of tools that people use. It's really uh, a sort of a, a group of tools that they implement as best they can, um, given the, the limitations around uh, their, their time and their effort. So I sort of have a follow-up question, but this is for basically everybody, if you can just put yourself in the shoes. Um, so we've, as we've just discussed, a lot of people don't have access to broadband, and you just said 27% of that group end up going to the public library, you know, using Wi-Fi in a cafe or something like that. So we're sitting there with someone who's going to log on to an online account on a publicly shared computer and um, hope that they actually log off or things like that. So I'm really wondering what you think or even for a computer owned by friends or family. So what are the risks of doing those kinds of transactions when you're actually ask, act, you know, accessing your personal data, not just ordering something online, but accessing your account and your information and even your social security number or something on the screen? And I don't know who wants to take the lead on that, but I'm very interested in that, if you can imagine. So I'm actually going to pivot a little bit on this because I'm not a technical expert right. and don't necessarily understand exactly what the risks of that are. But I think for, from the point of view of my research, it, it's sort of less a matter of risk and more of just one of logistical difficulty. Right. Okay. Uh, so, you know, I, I was thinking about, you know, examples of this that I could talk about in this discussion. And so, you know, picturing myself as a single mom who's got her kids home all day and needs to be able to, you know, talk to a representative during eight to five business hours so that she can address her issue that she's having with her return. And, you know, for someone like me, that's super easy, right? I've got a computer in front of my face literally 24 hours a day if I wanted to, if I wanted one. Um, for someone like that, if they don't have have you know a computer in the house? Um, you know they're going to have to find a way to you know park the kids somewhere for a few hours so they can go to a library or manage you know their kids running around at a McDonald's. Um, that's kind of a subpar user experience in a lot of ways and doesn't really lend itself to being able to engage with you know sort of in many cases very important crucial life decisions in a thoughtful, informed way. So I think. Um, that would be my kind of take on what's the impact of that in terms of uh, people's lives and how they can navigate uh, these types of services. Anybody else you want to do? Yeah. Hey, yeah, the board uh, survey addresses security concerns directly for mobile. Um, so we can, I can at least speak to um, what the survey says with regards to this question. We ask um, those who have not adopted more payments, more <laughs> banking, why they have not done so. Uh, one of the reasons, uh, one of the possible explanations and reasons we give uh, respondents is concerns over security. And we find um, that the reasons 
for security tend to be very much um, non-specific. We give them uh, many of options, including having their phone stolen, their phone hacked, uh, their information being misused. And of course, consumers um, check those off uh, when they say they um, have concerns or are not int or have not been using mobile banking, mobile <laughs> payments. Um, but the majority say all of the above. Um, <clears throat> over 60% say all of the above. And then we have a follow-up question because we're interested in how uh, people might be adopting and changing their uh, sentiment about these concerns. We ask them if their concerns that they've already stated were addressed, and that is there was this magic solution somehow provided to them, would they then undertake mobile banking, mobile payments? What do you think people say? That's right, they say they're not interested. Um, so it's a conundrum. Um, we ask uh, those who are using mobile banking, mobile payments, how secure they feel uh, with their transactions. And they seem pretty comfortable, very confident that uh, some of their transactions, which are done in public, you know, they're using a mobile phone, so some of these could be done while they're commuting, uh, while they're in a public space. And they feel comfortable that their transactions are safe, that they're not being hacked, and so forth. Uh, well, on the other hand, those who are not using mobile banking or are not doing mobile payments are not comfortable. Um, so it's an interesting res a set of results that's very much uh, bino binomial um, due to depending on whether you're a user or not. What I find intriguing is that users, non-users, uh, feel that the transactions that they're not undertaking are unsafe. Um, so they're ma making an assessment about a transaction that has not occurred or methods that have not occurred. Second, when you give them an option of saying, well, those transactions have now been magically uh, made more secure, they're still not interested. Um, so it's a very um, telling set of results, um, one, uh, but I'm not sure that I'm ready to make conclusions about those results. <laughs> <laughs> So I'm not sure how to relate this to my work, but I'm happy to give you my opinion as a consumer if that's helpful. I mean, I, I, you know, I, I will say that I think that every every sort of like new interface as a consumer does make me nervous. I feel like you know I do lose a bit of security. So for instance, actually just yesterday, uh, my wife and I's bank account uh, had some very significant spurious charges on it. Now Bank of America is going to cover those, no questions asked, because I, I assume because they want me to keep doing things online and buying things like that. Um, I, we have no idea how it was compromised. Um, you know, my email has been hacked. I've had, I have no idea how that's been compromised. You know, a password came from somewhere. Um, you know, it's not <laughs> like my, my email got fished or anything like that. So, I mean, this has happened to me four or five times in the last decade. It's probably happened to a lot of you, too. And every time you have a new portal like that, it makes me worried. So if I'm using the same email and password that I use, like, for my other accounts, it's compromised my IRS account, you know, is this really sensitive information going to be taken? And is the government going to make me whole in the way that Bank of America does? Do they have the incentive or the capability to do that? So that makes me nervous as a consumer, just as sort of a general right. take. And, and actually, if I can just add one thing, we've, we've done a little bit of work on this front. And one of the things that we've seen um, in some of our recent privacy research is that people really have a sense that they don't have a lot of control over what happens to their data once it leaves. And it, it, it you know, like you said, everyone has had, you know, their credit card company, their insurance company, OPA, you know, you name it. All of these supposedly secure entities, you know, let their data that was supposedly locked down as tight as could be uh, get breached. And so what we see is that, A, people are really sort of resigned to the fact that they just don't have a lot of impact over what happens so it, to their data once it leaves. It and doesn't they, and they, change. It doesn't change their behavior like they go offline. Well, it's a very, it's it's on a, it's sort of an, it's on a very case by case basis. So they really, it, it, you know, in the context of individual transactions, they sort of weigh the pros and the cons of, you know, is this individual transaction or this vendor that I'm working with, you know, is the deal that I'm getting good, en yeah. good enough to overcome my sort of latent concern that this information could get out there? And, um, you know, it, it really is done, you know, we've asked people, you know, the trade-offs that they make. And there are no sort of privacy absolutists or there are a very small number. Um, there are, uh, by comparison, a very small number of people who just hand out everything to anybody. Uh, so it's very much done on a on a case by case basis, and um, that's something that we've seen just in the last um, year or so. So that that rings true to me based on what we've seen in our work. The <laughs> survey has found that uh, since we started asking questions about security and password protection, specifically, more people are saying that they password protect their phone, for example. Um, this could be an industry response um, where the, that becomes enabled by default rather than the consumer taking that action. 
uh, but nevertheless, that's one thing that we've seen. Um, we also uh, say that when um, people sign up for mobile banking, they sign up to get uh, alerts when cases of fraud or other notification. Um, so in, this, in that sense, consumers are now more aware of transactions, uh, potentially fra fraudulent transactions that they, than they have ever been. I know that uh, before there was mobile banking, people's accounts were getting uh, access and charges being charged to, you know. Um, so the counterfactual, you know, that we need to ask is, what well, would have happened in the absence of the technology? And we cannot say that uh, people's um, financial, financial lives would not have been uh, at risk. They've always been at risk. It's just a matter of now that there's a different kind of risk. And the question is, is the, is the opportunity for prevention, uh, is that enhanced? Is that something that is, is available for consumers? So um, just one of the points that, that you made in the, in the study or that, the, that came out in your study, um, Mr. Gonzalez, is there's a difference in mobile banking and mobile payment use between rural and urban areas. Why is that? It's a really intriguing result. Um, we unfortunately did not have the opportunity to do a deep dive into this uh, interesting question um, just because of the logistical and resources uh, were not there. But the, we find at least a couple of uh, titillating possible, possible explanations. One is that folks in more rural areas uh, tend to have about the same uh, ownership of mobile phones, slightly less, but not much different. But we see a large difference in the ownership of smartphones. Much lower incidence of smartphone ownership among rural uh, <laughs> Americans. It's about, if I can find that number, 54% smartphone ownership in rural areas as opposed to 63% in more urban areas. Um, you need a smartphone to undertake more complicated transactions, quite frankly. Um, and then also, once you do have a smartphone, you need to have that broadband, mobile broadband access. And um, folks in more rural areas say that they are less likely to always have uh, available online uh, access than those in urban areas. So at least these two factors um, uh, might be contributing. But of course, this could be other reasons, like you know, are people in rural areas older? <laughs> um, that alone is a demographic factor that explains overall lower usage of mobile banking, mobile payments, smartphone ownership, et cetera. Did your study come up with observations about rural? You know? uh, certainly in terms of overall smartphone incidents, um, broadband adoption, um, all of those factors, certainly it's, mm -hmm. it's uh, much to a little lower um, for, for rural as well as, uh, as compared to urban or suburban, certainly. So, um, the other question that I have for Mr. Gonzalez is what factors are driving adoption of mobile banking and mobile payments? Like, you know, if we know that if you address all the security things, these non-users are not going to, that's not going to drive them to it. So what's sort of driving people to adopt them? Well, one is definitely the increase in smart, uh, smartphone ownership. Uh, that, well, uh, overall, mobile ownership has been around 86, 87 percent for the last five, six years uh, that we've been studying this question. What's been rising has been smartphone ownership. Um, and we see a concurrent increase in mobile banking among those who are smartphone owners. Um, so that's what, uh, the, the ability to actually undertake uh, the service is, is a condition necessary. Uh, the second is uh, some demographic factors are explaining some of the, some of the rise. For example, age. The, if you're under 45, you're more than likely going to be at least experimenting with mobile banking, mobile payments. Um, you know, like as has been mentioned already, uh, folks who are um, perhaps more experimental, more interested in new things, might, might take this. Those that are set on our ways, you know, no thanks. I'm not going to be following that uh, that newfangled internet thing. Um, and then another interesting finding from our survey is minorities. Um, being a minority results in higher uh, mobile banking, um, mobile payments, and all, as well as uh, smart smartphone ownership, uh, perhaps because it's an issue of broadband access at home. Um, so those demographic factors are driving the adoption. Um, but to the extent that it becomes something that's more commonplace, that might filter through uh, to the older generation as well. 
So those complete my questions. I don't know whether any you have other points that you want to make that I haven't inquired about. Um, I will note that the IRS website has 140,000 web pages, and not a single one of them are mobile, you know, adapted. Um, the Taxpayer Advocate Service does have a website that adapts to mobile devices, but we just will point that out. Um, so I move the floor open to people if they want to ask questions of the panel or make comments. Observations. With that, our third panel is complete. I want to thank them very much for coming and sharing this invaluable information. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. That I brought a limited number of uh, copies of the report in case people are interested in taking one up. I want one. <laughs> <laughs>